Can you guys hear me? Uh-huh. It's not working. It's not. Why do I look upset? I got to trim my beard. What's happening, guys? Usually a commercial comes on. Now, remember, we're going to get a few bufferings here and there. Hopefully the day will come. No bufferings by the grace of Jesus Christ. Good to see you guys. Hopefully the regulars will show up. And we're going to talk about being born again, trusting the Holy Spirit to really bless me and really guide me and truly <clears throat> protect me from error and grant me wisdom, knowledge, understanding in the subject to interpret the scriptures correctly for the glory, praise, majesty, and honor of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Father, Son, Spirit, in Jesus' almighty name, Yehovah, Father, Son, Spirit. Yep. Revelation 22, 13, you were in the previous session with Hatun. And you were going back and forth with that guy, Dale Lee, right? We're all tired, Kevin. I'm drained today myself. Yeah, it seems that Hatun is not doing too well, is she? She looked very ill, very sick. And she kept hinting about dying and being with Jesus Christ, and we have nothing to fear, which is absolutely true. I don't like to read between the lines, and I don't know. And I don't know what's going on with her, but pray for her in Jesus' name. It almost like she was trying to say not so many words. The Lord Jesus may be calling her home. Yeah, she would look very ill. And I think she didn't want to come out and say it so people don't panic. But I think she was hinting at the fact that unless Jesus Christ, our Lord, heals her of whatever, she may be going home because she really looked bad. So keep praying for her. This is the way of all the earth. We're not going to live forever in these corruptible bodies. <clears throat> Jesus Christ, our Lord, promised to return physically to the earth, and then he's going to transform this world, transform our corruptible bodies, resurrect those who have died in him. Pray, she will get better. But one thing I want everyone to realize, a reminder, just, just a reminder. <clears throat> we pray that the Lord Jesus Christ in his love and mercy will extend our earthly life only to be used mightily for his glory. And Hatun is a warrior, right? But the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't need us. And she said that, doesn't need us. So either he can extend her earthly life or take her home, which is better for her, better for her, better for me to go to be with Jesus. But pray and hope that it's nothing, and Jesus Christ our Lord is pleased to keep around. But don't forget about Nabil Qureshi. He was 34 years old, and the Lord Jesus was pleased to take him home, right? See, now notice Andrew Martin. Notice what he called her, and I want to read this. I hope she recovers and gets her strength back. The lioness of Christianity, and that's what she is. She is a lioness of Christianity, a warrior. Yeah, yeah, hallelujah. Guys, just keep praying for my phone. Let me just call this brother here. Just my phone is like the screen is like getting dark, and I don't know. Maybe someone can help me later. But here, I just want you. This is my childhood buddy. I'm going to put him online. Oh. I'm going to watch here. Live stream. Hello? Stu, I'm live. I'm on my live stream. Hello, just want you to know, I'm on my live stream. People can hear you. I just want people to know they can't oh. see your face, but hold on. I don't want them to see your face because, you know, oh I just – uh, uh, Listen, this guy on the phone, guys, you can't hear him. This guy is my childhood buddy. Him and I, best of friends and brothers since we were in grammar school. We call him Stu. God has blessed him with three young lions, three boys, handsome, who love Jesus. Pray for Stu. Pray for his wife and three kids. And I can say for the past couple of years, this man has been used – of God to bless me and help me in my financial need. So we just want to say, Peggy Sue, we love you. Stu. Thank you, thank you. All right. So just say hi to them because they can hear him. Well, hey, guys. A pleasure to help. All right. Well, God bless you. So, Stu, I'm going to call you when I'm done. Huh? Okay. I'll just come to let you know I talked to Sal. You're going to come by. Okay. Thank you. I like you, Stu. But I'm going to talk to you a little later. Thank you. All right, buddy. God bless yeah. you. Sure. Bye-bye. Right. So how do you guys like that? That was Peggy Stu, I love you. Peggy Stu, I love you. With a love so rare and true. A Peggy, my Peggy Stu. 
By the way, we have another precious sister that just joined us with a praise report. Marcy Lynn, are you here? Now, where are my mods? Are they here? Are the mods here? Okay, good. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. And Protestants here. Okay. Now, Protestant, if my star buffering, text me because she gave me permission to read this email she sent me. Let me just tell you who Marcy Lynn is. She's right there. She's a nurse. She's now working in hospitals and exposing herself to the potential threat of coronavirus. And she's not afraid because she has no doubt Jesus is Lord. He's alive. And Jesus is in love with her. And she was, she's been battling cancer. She's right here, Marcy. Let everyone know because she sent me this email because you've been praying for her. And she gave me permission to read this email. So I'm going to read it. You ready? Peggy, it's I love you. I love you. A testimony to the goodness of our God. Okay, you ready? She gave me permission. And, and let me know, bro. Uh, text me if I, because I'm on a buffer, obviously. It's going to buffer. So don't kid yourselves. It buffers. Unless Jesus Christ, the Lord, just removes it completely. Okay. Here is Marcy Lynn's email. Okay. You guys ready? She gave me permission to read this. And I want you to keep praying hard for her, for Hatun, and pray for all of us. Just let me remind you, folks, Jesus is alive. He is almighty. He is risen. He is real. And he is the one, by his all-powerful word, overseeing, controlling creation. And if Jesus is in love with us, we fear nothing. Not even death, even if we have to die. That's nothing. Now, let me read this email. Okay. Hi, Sam. Been working a lot lately. We are short a nurse for my night shift, and I've been covering. So remember, she still has cancer, and she's still going there faithfully, being Jesus to the people. Now watch this. With this cancer, I did seven treatments. It was just one molecule of chemo combined with a hormone blocker. Well, just that tiny bit made me really sick, so I stopped three months ago all treatment. My cancer marker blood test went up to 65.3, 65.3. Pay attention to this testimony, folks. Look how amazing our Lord Jesus is. So I decided I'm just going to do nothing and go home to Jesus. So she resolved it. I'm ready to die, Jesus. I'm not afraid of this because you're real. So once you let go and show the Lord you trust him, watch here. I was scared but ready. After talking to you and listening to a podcast you sent me, I was not scared anymore. Glory to the Lord Jesus for using a fat, overweight maggot like me to preach his word and make his promises true so the Holy Spirit used that sermon to destroy her fear. I was not scared anymore. I was ready to die and go home. Matter of fact, I wanted to die. Sick of this evil, lying world, I wanted out. Now watch here. Guys, watch. Okay. So I went to the Father, notice, with this confidence, I don't fear anymore, Lord. You are God. Death is nothing. With that confidence that the Holy Spirit gave her from the Word. So I went to the Father in Jesus' name and said, I'm done, and I'm leaving it all, uh, it, and <clears throat> I'm leaving it all in your hands. Holy Spirit, loosen my tongue. If you want me here, it's up to you to deal with the cancer. I had my three-month labs yesterday. My cancer marker is down to 40. Normal is 2.5, but it's gone down from 64 to 40. Clearly, Jesus isn't done with me yet, and the prayers from you and the group have worked from 65 to 40. And we're going to keep praying in Jesus' name that the Holy Spirit burns up the cancer, destroys it in Jesus' name. Don't stop praying, right? Thank you and the group for praying for me because this, according to the doctors, doing zero treatment and having my markers drop so low is very unusual. They're shocked. Not expected. All glory to God and Jesus Christ. All glory to God and Jesus Christ. But now notice what she says. I guess I still have work to do. Honestly, I'm a bit disappointed. I was ready and wanting to go home. But I guess Jesus has other plans for me. Hallelujah. See that? So guys, will you covenant with her? And keep praying for her, even fast for her, and pray and fast for one another and for Atun. Without chemo anymore, it shrunk. Okay? So that's how amazing our Lord is. Father, we love you. 
Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. We have to begin every session by just praising you as a body, glorifying you and loving you and adoring you and magnifying you, Father. Magnifying you, Lord Jesus, magnifying you, Holy Spirit, because we exist because of you. We exist for you. And true life, true joy, true love, true happiness, all of that is from you, the source of all joy and love and life and completeness and wholeness and peace and happiness and satisfaction. Because we are designed to find true fulfillment and joy and satisfaction in you, the source of our life, the source of our existence and our being, Father. Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, the one true God. Help us to love you more, Father. Help us to love you more, Lord Jesus. Help us to love you more, Holy Spirit. Help us to trust in you more completely. And please restore our fears and our doubts and our unbelief. And save us from our own flesh and our sinful passions. And fill us with the fruit and the passion and the life from your Holy Spirit. To walk worthy of Jesus Christ. To love Jesus Christ. To trust Jesus Christ. And let him guide us. Please, my God. Please, my Father. Please, Lord Jesus. Please, Holy Spirit. Bless us in this time. Bless Marcy Lynn. Bless Hatun. Watch over them. Bless our loved ones. In my case, my precious daughters. How I love and ache for them. But you love them more. They belong to you, not to me. They are yours in your hands, Father. In your hands, Lord Jesus. In your hands, Holy Spirit. Bless them and provide for them overabundantly. And convict their mother to fear the Lord Jesus and turn to Jesus and repent of her sins and walk worthy of the Lord. That she too will be saved from the wrath to come. And I pray for everyone here, anyone who's sick, anyone who has loved ones who are sick, whether elderly in their, in their house, households or their spouses or their siblings or their children, cover them, wash them, cleanse them and us, myself, and the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, because by his wounds, by his stripes, by the blood of the cross of Jesus, we are whole. We are made complete and whole spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, and physically. And Abba, please provide our daily bread until it's time for us to go. Please, Lord, I need you to bless this session and help me not to make any mistakes, not to misinterpret scripture. Enable me to recall the passages and interpret them co correctly. And please save me from stammering and confusion and loosen my tongue. Anoint my mouth by your spirit for the glory of Jesus and bless them, Father. Bless them, Lord Jesus. Bless them who are listening, Holy Spirit, with wisdom and knowledge and understanding. And then the, the passion and the desire and the strength to live out the revelations that we receive from the scriptures. Please, my God, bless us, Lord, for your glory. Save us from attacks of Satan and his children. Bind them up. Cast them away, Lord, far from us. And make us the salt of the earth and the light of the world. To not fear death. Death is nothing before the feet of Jesus. He is alive. Give us the faith to never doubt it. And that when death comes, we will say, welcome. Because this is the door I must enter to see the human face of Jesus. And kiss the human hands of Jesus. And bow and kiss the human feet of Jesus. And worship in his presence. The God man. Your, your heart father. Your love. Your son our Lord. And seal us by your spirit. In Jesus almighty name. Yehovah Father Son of Spirit. Yehovah Father Son of Spirit. Yehovah Father Son of Spirit. Yehovah Rapha. Yehovah Rapha. Yehovah Rapha. Yehovah Father Okay guys. Praise the Lord. I'll ask you before I end the session, because if we're all, some of us are not officially locked in our homes, but still we got nowhere to go. Even though officially you're not locked in your homes, still you're not working and there's nowhere to go. So I plan on doing another session in a few hours, if God is pleased. So I'll let you know whether I'll do Islamic Isa or live Q&A with open Skype. Live Q&A with open Skype. But if I do a live Q&A with open Skype, that means you guys got to call in with your questions. Or we're just going to sit there and I'll be singing. Caught in a trap. And I'll hear what I have. All of you join me. Why oh, see what you do with me. It's no one ever. I'll be fine. With me. All right. It doesn't help doing Elvis like this when you have coffee stained teeth. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. Okay, with that said, let's continue where we left off. Why must we be born again? 
An Anonymous, if I open up the session for live Q&A and open Skype, that means you can ask the questions in the text or you can call me. So good to see you, brother. Sorry, Al, I forgot to text you with live stream, but praise Jesus Christ, my brother Al joined. I knew I forgot something. All right, but praise the Lord. I hope Luis is here too. I want all the newbies. And by the way, on Discord, I need a shout out from Discord. Do we have all the regulars there? Ex-Muslim, Ibn Khan, daughter of Christ. Are they there? Or are they sleeping? MM, did she take a nap again? Everyone there? All right, this bicep is gone. I don't have it. Everyone there? They're okay? What about daughter Christ? What it is? Thomas, are you going to ask me a question in a session I'm going to be doing on being born again? Or are you going to wait for the live Q&A and open Skype? Okay, with that said, let's get into where we left off. And guys, for the sake of the Lord, for his glory, and for you guys to understand what the Bible teaches, I really ask several things of you. Make sure you just focus and ask the Spirit to help you to focus and don't get distracted. No side discussions and debates. And do not ask questions not relevant to the topic. Because yesterday, I'm talking about male and female being one Adam. And then a brother asked me, were animals male and female? And I had to say, no, they were transgender. Come on, man. So hold on. When you look at animals now, are they? <laughs> I'm sorry, man. I apologize, honestly, because well, I mean, honestly, I don't mean honestly. If animals were not created male and female, how did they end up male and female now? Do you guys remember that question? The guy asked me where well, I was radioactive. Were animals male and female? No, I said they're transgender. Transgender. They were the first LGBTQ transgender community. I don't know how to answer that question. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, Luisa, tell your 15-year-old is just because some of the questions are so, the answers are so obvious that to ask, to ask the question is like I feel insulted. I feel insulted when someone asks that question. If they weren't males and females when God initially created them, there were male animals like a male dog and a female dog. How do they become it? Anyway, with that said, that's why I want you to focus, please. No side discussions, no tangents, no debates. And make your questions relevant because this is an important topic. Why the Bible teaches the necessity of the new birth. And we started with the fall. Remember? Oh, so already active. You're upset? No. He didn't make him singular, meaning one person. So it's not a fair question. Adam wasn't singular, one person. He made a male and female from the start. I mean, that was in Genesis 1.26, right? Genesis 2 simply states the obvious that... <clears throat> The way Eve was created came out of Adam, but Genesis 1 gives you the overview of radioactive. Don't get offensive. It was a silly question, okay? Because Genesis 1 tells you that God's design for Adam was to be more than one person to procreate. And so Genesis 2 fills in the details of how God went about to create the female, to complement the male, because both make up Adam. Not just individually, but collectively. But it's okay, radio. I know you're hurt. I'm going to hear Let me sing you a song because I love you, radio. Hush, little radio, don't say a word. Protestant's going to buy you a mockingbird. And if that mockingbird don't sing, Riaz is going to buy you a diamond ring. And if that diamond ring don't shine. All right, let's go. You ready? Are we ready now? Love you, radio, but not too much. Just don't be too active. Focus now. Focus now, okay? No, it's okay. Luisa, if a question is, how do I put this? If a question is from someone's heart and it's pertinent to salvation, then it's not stupid. But if a question is irrelevant and doesn't really have to do with salvation and the answer is common sense, that's a different story. You know, that's a different story, Louisa. But anyway, don't feel embarrassed. But anyway, now let's focus by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's continue the story of Adam and Eve. Did everyone understand from yesterday's talk, which you must have listened to in order for this to make sense? Otherwise, you're going to get lost. Does, any, does everyone understand that when God created Adam and Eve, he created them good? Their, their design was good, flawless. 
but he created them with the capacity, the ability to desire to choose contrary to God. Right? We saw that, right? And then we saw what happened when they chose to go against God's will. Their minds became corrupted. Their perception of reality became corrupted and tainted. Their desires became corrupted. So we saw the effects of sin. That one sin of disobedience, all the damage it did upon Adam and Eve. Because now, what was at one time a state of innocence and purity became something shameful. In other words, prior to eating the tree, Adam and Eve were naked. But their minds were such... Their perception was such that they saw the nakedness as something innocent, something good, something pure. But the moment they ate of the forbidden tree, their mind, their psyche, their their what we call, yeah, their psychological makeup became tainted, corrupted. So now what was pure became impure, shameful, something they were ashamed of. So you see, sin taints, perverts, corrupts your perception. Your mind, the way you see things. That was the first thing. The second thing we saw, this is a quick uh, overview. Prior to them eating of the forbidden tree, God would show up and they would delight to be in the presence of God, run <clears throat> to the presence of God, and experience perfect fellowship with their creator who had given them everything, everything on a platter. But the moment they sinned, the moment they sinned, they ran from God out of shame <clears throat> instead of running to God. And they hid themselves from the face of God, the presence of God. So notice the second effect of sin. Sin causes you to run from God, not run to God. Sin causes you to hide from God, not seek God and his forgiveness. In other words, sin hinders you, incapacitates you, from running to God and seek his forgiveness, seeking his face to forgive you and restore you. You saw that, right? That was the second thing we saw. And I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to make sure I choose the right words to interpret scriptures clearly and not pervert scriptures. All right, pay attention. Okay. The third thing you notice in that conversation is that sin also <clears throat> prevents you and in inhibits you, prohibits you, from taking responsibility for your sin, for your action, and trying to find a scapegoat, blaming someone else for your sins, for your mistakes, for your failures. And notice all of those things are true of Adam and Eve's descendants. We are all Adams and Eves running around because we repeat that same pattern of our parents. Right? Then the blame game, the scapegoat. So notice what sin, did, sin does. Not only does it prevent you from confessing your sin, acknowledging your sin, and being sorry for your sin and repenting for your, for your sin, you try to justify your sin by blaming someone or something else. That was yesterday's session. I'm repeating it. You with me there? King of kings, you make that same mistake they do. And notice how Adam, <clears throat> threw the goodness of God in God's face. He took good, the goodness of God and threw it back in his face because he said, the woman you gave me. God gave Adam a woman because God saw it wasn't good for the man, the male, Adam, to be alone. So out of his love and compassion, he created a helper suitable and equal to him in essence, who could be his companion and friend, as well as his lover, husband and wife, right? <clears throat> so he wouldn't be alone. So out of God's goodness, he gave him a woman, and Adam took God, God's goodness and threw it in his face. You gave me this woman. Right? Another element of sin, and then he blamed the serpent. Another element of sin. Instead of seeking God to cover you in his love and compassion, you seek to cover your own sinfulness by your own righteous deeds. Are you with me there? Let me repeat that again. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unpack that a little more. 
sin also causes you to try to cover up your own shame and guilt by your own efforts instead of turning to God and trusting in his provision to cover over your shame and to forgive you. How do I know that? Where am I getting that from? Let's go to Genesis 3 again. Let's read 6 and 7. Genesis 3, 6 and 7. It causes you to find your own solution to your problem and to try to solve your problem in your own strength, in your own effort, instead of turning to God and having God cover over the damage you've done and restore and forgive you. Here you go. Genesis 3, 6 to 7. Holy Spirit, bless this session to go into the depth of, of these passages and bring out all the meat for the glory of Jesus. We trust in you, Holy Spirit. Here, read. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired. See, now sin is starting to form in her heart. She's starting now to have sinful inclinations. She's now desiring that which goes against God's will. Notice it start. I need to unpack this. Sin isn't when you commit an unlawful act. Sin starts in your heart. When you desire something contrary to God's will, that's when sin is birthed. Are you with me? The action is the fruit and the result of the desire. Okay. Follow with me, guys. Eve's sin wasn't when she ate. Eve's sin is when she desired something in her heart that was contrary to God's will. The action is the fruit of a desire that wants something that goes against God's will. Because what is sin, according to the Bible? Sin is lawlessness. Sin is disregard for the law of God. Sin is going against God's law, God's commands, God's will. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Yes, I need to unpack these. So I'm going to go slow, folks. There's a lot I need to unpack, and I don't want to. I don't want to miss out, but sometimes I feel like I'm pressed and I need to, but I'm going to go slow. First John 3, 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. Sin is the violation, the breaking of God's law. And Adam and Eve were given law. Did you know that? People say, right, that Adam and Eve didn't have any laws to follow. Yes, they did. They were given only one law to follow. Don't eat of this tree. This is a command. This is a law. Don't violate this command of mine. So they were given only one command to follow. They were given a law. The law was eat of everything in the garden. Rule over my creation. Procreate. These are all commands. But here's one forbidden thing. Don't touch the tree. See, that's law. That's command. So by... Eating of the tree, they willfully broke the command of God. They willfully broke the law of God. They willfully sinned against God's law. That's what sin is. Violating the law of God. Is that clear? Everyone getting this? I just want to make sure you're getting this. All right. So now... Sin starts in the heart, starts in your desires, starts in your mind, and then the fruit of sin is the action. So notice Eve started desiring that which was forbidden. See, sin was starting to arouse in her. She was now giving birth to sin internally. You get it? Now sin was taking shape and forming within her because she had the... <clears throat> The ability to desire something contrary to God's will. As that desire sunk in, instead of checking it and saying no, she fed it until she bore its fruit. What was its fruit? Eating of the tree and dying. Exactly, Pedro. I want to kiss your head. Exactly, Pedro. God bless you. You made the insight. Never trust the desires of your heart. Always check your desires in light of God's word, the Holy Bible. 
Yes, Anna. The serpent planted that seed by whispering in her ear and causing her to doubt. She could have checked that desire and that instigation of the devil, that satanic instigation by saying, no, God said, don't eat this. And we trust God over you, especially all that God has done. God has proven his love for us. He has earned our trust in him. Who are you to question this God? She didn't do that. Right? She didn't do that, did she? Now, let me show you what I just said in, in James. James 4, 13 and 15. James 4, 13 and 15. When you say all your thoughts are, are your own, well, they come from your mind. They come from your heart. But someone can influence your thoughts and your desires and your heart. But you can check them by the power of the Holy Spirit. But that's another topic. Pay attention. James 4, 13. I'm sorry. Why am I saying James 4, 13? James 1, 13 to 15. 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 Sorry about that. I don't know why James came in my mind. Something about four. Maybe I need four slices of pizza. Who knows? James 1, 13 to 15. Let no man say when he's tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Rather tempteth he any man. So he doesn't. Neither. Neither tempteth he any man. Now watch. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. His own lust. And enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. What's the point? It starts within you, your desires. When you desire something contrary to God and you feed it and then you act upon it, the fruit is an action that results in death. Because when you sin, you die. You with me there? Is everyone getting this? Before I move on? Because I want to unpack what you're finding in Genesis 3, verse 6. Other passages that confirm that it starts from within your heart. It starts from within your heart. 1 John 3, verse 15. Now you see why you need to be born again, right? Now you see why you need a heart transplant, a spiritual heart transplant. Oh, good. I didn't know that. I haven't read it fully. Okay? 1 John 3, 15. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And he know, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Why is our Lord Jesus saying, if you hate your brother, you're a murderer? You know why? You don't murder someone you love. You don't murder someone you're happy with. You don't murder someone you're in love with. You murder someone whom you hate with a passion. So what is Jesus saying? It's the hate in your heart that produced the fruit of murder. Cleanse your heart of hate, you won't murder. You catch it or no? You see what he says here? I mean, here, 1 John 3, 15. I want to make sure it's sinking in. You see what he just said? If you hate your brother, you're a murderer. But Lord, what do you mean I'm a murderer? He's dealing with the root problem of all these sinful actions. I commit adultery because I lusted for a mar married woman. I had premarital sex because I lusted for a woman, right? I ended up snapping and killing someone because of the anger and hatred and rage in my heart towards that someone. Cleanse your heart of all that evil and filth, and all of its symptoms and fruits will disappear. It will take care of itself. Is it making sense? I'm really trying to give you me and make it as simple as possible by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Matthew 5, 27 and 28. Yes, they can, ontologics. Yes, they can. That's why there's a spirit realm opposing you. Did they not influence Adam and Eve? Okay. Now watch. Matthew 5, 27 and 28. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman... To lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. What our Lord is saying is adultery is the symptom. It's the fruit of a deeper problem. 
If I didn't lust for that woman, I wouldn't have slept with her. You understand what our Lord is saying? If I have no sexual desire for a woman, I won't touch her. If I have no lustful desire for a married woman, I won't touch her. So Jesus is saying, you're looking at the action, the fruit, the symptom, but you're not dealing with the root, the cause of that. A heart full of lust. Purify the heart of lust. No adultery. No sexual immorality. No premarital sex. You see? You understand what our Lord is saying here? Is it making sense to every one of you? Yep. Now, final example from the New Testament to explain what happened with Eve. Mark 7, 18 to 23. As the Holy Spirit grants me wisdom, understanding, and insight for his glory. Mark 7, 18 to 23. You see how beautifully deep the scriptures are? How the Holy Spirit, Lord, offering in Jesus' name, please, my God. You see how deep the Bible is, how wonderfully deep the Bible is, and it accurately, it accurately describes the human condition, the human state, and has its answers. Because this is the word of the creator of man. And who knows creation better than the creator? Mark 7, 18 to 23, read with me. And he saith unto me, Are you so without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entered into the man, it cannot defile him? He's talking about food. I eat burger. It's not going to defile me morally or spiritually. A burger, a pizza slice, is not going to defile me morally or spiritually. Because it entered not into this heart, meaning the inner man, the soul, the spirit, the mind, the psyche. It doesn't affect that. But into the belly and goeth out into the drought, purging all meats. And he said, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. Notice what our Lord says. For from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil. From within, out of the heart of men proceed evil. Right? Cometh out and he said that which comes out of the man that defiled the man from, from within out of the heart men proceed evil thoughts adulteries fornications murders thefts covetousness wickedness deceit hedonism an evil eye blasphemies blasphemies right <clears throat> sorry about that because I have to scroll up all the time pride foolishness all these evil things come from within and defile the man. You know, you see why you need to be born again? If this is all from your heart, your soul, your spirit, from your inner self and your thoughts, that means you are sick spiritually, you are tainted spiritually, you are corrupted spiritually, and you need a transformation. So I hate because my heart is sick. I lust because my heart is sick. <clears throat> I covet because my heart is sick. I steal. See, it's all, it all goes back into the heart. So where do you find this? You find this in Genesis 3, verse 6. Let's look at Genesis 3, verses 6 to 7 again. Exactly sort of truth. You're worried about the coronavirus, but you're not worried about the sin virus that's damned more people to hell than anyone else, anything else. Okay? Genesis 3, 6 to 7. And when the woman saw that the tree was good, see, saw, she desired with her eyes. And that it pleaseth pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. Pride, she wants to be wise. She wants to have wisdom and be known for being a wise woman. Pride, pride, catch it here. Okay. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and give also unto her husband with her and he did eat. Let me read it again. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, desired, desired it because it looked good, pleasant to eat, tasty. And it was pleasant to the eyes, and it was good looking. So notice her appetite. Her eyes desired something beautiful, and her body craved something that looked delicious. The appetites. And why? Because she thought, if I eat, then I'll become wise. So if I'm wise, then I have dignity. Ya Allahi. In Jesus' name. And I hate when it buffers. Pride. You see it? Notice. Beauty. 
satisfying your appetites and giving you a status to make you proud and think you're special. And isn't that how we fall? Even when it comes to, again, I'm saying this because it's common to many, a common sin amongst every, everyone is sexual. Exactly. Why are people rampant in sexual morality? Because when you see someone beautiful, you desire it. And then it makes you desire to then sleep with them because it fulfills that sexual appetite. And in a way, in a sick way, when someone attracts and sleeps with you, it makes you feel good. That means, see, I'm beautiful or I'm handsome and desirable. You catch it? Is that how it works? It's like these women that boast about sleeping with all these athletes or actors. They, they wear that as a badge of honor. Why? Why? Because look, this actor thought of me attractive enough to sleep with me. So that means I'm special. You see? Pride. You see how it works? Isn't that it? Let's be honest. I'm not saying confess here, on the, on, but I'm saying examine yourselves in your past before you came to Christ. Especially if you've been very active in that area, even though the Lord says no sex before marriage, sex only between husband and wife. You don't get married, carry your cross, crucify your flesh, refrain from sex. And by the blood of Jesus, that's what we're going to do. Okay, now, how many times when you did commit sexual immorality, you did so because the woman was so beautiful and you wanted to sleep with her so you can go boast to your pals, look at me, brah, I'm a player, man, I'm a Mac daddy. I got that, right? Isn't it true? Isn't it true? And you see where it all began for humanity in the garden. In the garden. It's going to get better. It's going to get better. Hold on. In Jesus' name. In the garden. Yep, I said Mac Daddy. You know how it was. That's, I'm dating myself because my... my my teenagers, that's how we used to talk. Man, he a Mac daddy. Man, he a player. What up, player? Play, 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 play. Play, play. Anyway. Now let's go to Genesis 3, 6 to 8. I don't know. You don't remember when you used to say Mac daddy, you little sinner? What, you think you're younger than me and cooler than me? Hater, there goes that pride again. Blair, why you be blaying, man? AD, why you be blaying? I be blayer. You make them beauties. Okay, let's read. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open. Now, not open in a good way. What this text is saying, their eyes became open to the corrupting influence of sin. See, the Bible talks about your eyes open in one of two ways. Open to the truth of God or open to the evil, sinful passions of the world. Here, their eyes were open to the corrupting influence of sin. And they knew that they were naked, but they knew they were naked before that. But now their nakedness was something sinful because their eyes had been corrupted. Their minds had been corrupted. Whereas before that, they were together naked. They felt no shame. Now they're embarrassed. Now they feel shame because their eyes have been opened to the corrupting influence of sin. But notice what they do. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And then here's verse 8. And they heard the voice of Jehovah God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the face of Jehovah God amongst the trees of the garden. Did you catch it now? Sin made them run from God, too embarrassed to run to God, and fall before the feet of God, and ask God for mercy and compassion. And sin made them cover their own nakedness through their own efforts. You see it? They covered themselves with apron of figs. They tried by their own effort to cover over their shame, but God still saw through their nakedness. You understand what you're being told here? Their nakedness. In Jesus' name, God still saw their nakedness. He still saw their nakedness. 
Because unless God covers you, there's nothing you can do to cover your nakedness and shame before God. He has to cover your nakedness and shame. Did you catch it? You understand? They tried in their own effort, by their own deeds, to cover their shame, but God still saw their nakedness. Why are you running? Why are you hiding? Did you do what I told you not to do? So what you learn from here is, man cannot, by his own efforts, cover over his shame and nakedness. He must trust in the provision of God. He must trust in God graciously covering over his nakedness out of his love, compassion, and pity. But how does God do that? Here you're going to see God already pointing the way to salvation, pointing the way to having your sinfulness covered over through death. Where am I getting this from? Genesis 3, verse 21. Genesis 3, verse 21. Watch here. This is where I need you guys to pay attention. Get ready to be blown away. You really want me to go deep, right? You want me? Then listen. And unto Adam also... And to his wife, did Jehovah God make coats of skins and clothe them? It was God who clothed them. And now their nakedness had been covered. Their nakedness was covered. But notice he covered them not with fig leaves or the leaves of some tree, but he covered them with coats made of skin. Here it would have to be animal skin. But for God to provide coats of skin... From an animal, that animal had to be put to death. An animal had to die and be sacrificed. Exactly, King of Kings. We don't know. Let's not guess, Cloudy. Do you want me to add to the scripture, Cloudy? Just make it up, even though the text doesn't say it? I like how Cloudy. Lamb, do you think? No, I don't think, because if anything I say, I'll be wrong, because it doesn't say. Did you catch it now? Before I move on? You understand what I just said? Coats of skin. Coats of skin. Well, hold on. It's not coat made of leaves. It's Ya Allahi. Oh, Yehovah Father Spirit. It's not coats of skin, right? I'm sorry. It's not coats of leaves. The Lord Jesus save us from buffering. Please, Lord, for your glory. Right? It's not coats of leaves. It's coats of skin. But it can't be human skin because Adam and Eve are the first human beings, right? The first human beings? Make sure you hit that like button. Everyone with me before I move on? So these skins that God produced coats from to cover Adam and Eve, where they come from? It had to be an animal. We're not told what animal. In other words, here from the first book of the Old Testament, the third chapter of the first book of the Old Testament, written by Moses 1,500 years before the birth of Christ, we are shown that sin brings death, and the payment of sin is death. So either you die for your sin, or someone else can die in your place to save you from death. Right? Right? Save you from death. Okay. Let me, let's me let go to Genesis 2.18. And a lot of translations tr mistranslate this. But let me show you something in Genesis 2 verse 18. That shows you God covered them and didn't condemn them to hell. He didn't condemn them to hell. Okay. Genesis 2.18. Watch here, guys. Pay attention. And Jehovah God said, it is not good. See, again, because my mind is skipping because of the buffering. Lord Jesus, save us. Perfect us and save us from these distractions, Lord. But anyway, and Jehovah God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help me for him. All right. And the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. Let us make him a help like unto himself. What translation, Protestant, are you smoking to, bro? Are you like shutting down? What translation did you just quote? What and where the heck did you get this translation that butchered what the text said? Okay. Okay, why would you quote Dewey Rames, bro? Okay, let's go back. Now, quote to me Genesis 2, 15 to 17. Now, who's going to cover this guy's Alzheimer's? Genesis 2, verses 15 to 17. Okay, pay attention. 
Okay. Genesis 2, verses 15 to 17. And Jehovah God, exactly, exactly. See, I wanted to see who's going to catch me. I blame the buffering for my shutdown. See, I am a son of Adam and what? Okay. I'm going to blame you for this distraction. Genesis 2, 15 to 17. Read with me, guys. Focus, focus. And Jehovah God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And Jehovah God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest, mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, don't make it complicated. Don't read into this passage more than necessary. When Jehovah says, the day you eat, you shall die, he meant physical death. That you would die physically instead of living forever in your physical body. But did you notice Je Jehovah did not strike Adam dead that day, but he extended his earthly life so that Adam lived 930 years? Do you know why? Do you know why? Because he said, you will die that day you eat. He ate on that day. He didn't die. Do you know why? Because God in his mercy allowed someone else to take his place in death so that God could extend his earthly life. Exactly, Mickey. Mickey got it. So God didn't break his word. God didn't falsify his word. God didn't abrogate his word. God didn't go against his word. So here you see the principle of substitutionary atonement, meaning God says, when you sin, you die. But in my love, I will make a provision where I can spare you from death by having a substitute take your place in death. Are you seeing it here? Do you see how much meat there is in Genesis chapter 3? How much meat there is in Genesis chapter 2? How, mu how much meat there is in Genesis 1? Rad tag, if you ask me what was the substitute, I'm tempted to block you, rad tag. Are you really listening? What part of the coat of skin wasn't clear? So this is where I get upset because you saw the passage and I explained the passage and you still ask me what the substitute was. The substitute, it's like asking me if the animals were male and female. No, they were transgender. Okay, let's come back here. Guys, focus. When you ask me this question, that means you're not listening. You're not focusing. And, okay. You're doing yourself a disservice if you're not paying attention. When I repeat the same point more than once, that means you're not listening. Listen. Okay. Please. I want you to get this. Everyone there? So you see, God did not go back on his word. God did not lie. God did not abrogate his command. He still caused someone to die for that sin. But in his love and mercy for Adam, he spared him death to extend his earthly life and had an animal die in his place so that God's judgment would not be proven false, but that God would demonstrate that though he's a loving, compassionate God, he's a just God, and his justice must be satisfied. Right? Are you getting it? This is similar to the story of Abraham and Isaac. You remember when God tells Abraham, offer Isaac as a burnt offering. You remember that, right? Let's go to Genesis 22, verses 9 to 11. Genesis 22, verses 9 to 11. And notice who sacrificed God did. Not only was it the first sacrifice, it wasn't a human who sacrificed to God. It was God who provided the sacrifice and did the sacrifice himself. He's the one who sacrificed. He's the one who did the sacrifice. He provided the sacrifice for himself to satisfy his justice, to keep faithful to his word, and to make provision to cover, cover over their nakedness. And that's what he does in Jesus Christ. God became man in order to become the Lamb of God who would offer himself 
as a sacrifice to satisfy his justice and make provision for the salvation of his people. Okay. Genesis 22, 9 to 11. And they came to the place which God had told them of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in, in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of Jehovah called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. So right before he kills him, the angel from heaven shouts, Abraham. And then let's read verse 12. Let's read verse 12. Watch here. Man, we went for 124, 115. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad. Neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Okay, now, end of story, and they're free to go. No, because in verse 13, Abraham looks up and he finds a ram caught in the thicket. And notice what it says about that ram. Now, who provided that ram? Who made sure that ram would be caught in a thorn bush? Verse 13, watch here. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went, took the ram, and offered him up for a burnt offering in the, in the stead of his son. So he sacrificed the animal instead of his son. Why didn't God simply let Abraham go? Because here you're taught that principle that you learn in Genesis. When God says something, it must be done. You must offer Isaac as a burnt offering. So instead of just letting them go and saying, okay, you passed the test, you can go. No, because a burnt offering must still be offered. But in grace, it won't be your son. It will be a substitute taking the place of your son as a picture that the soul that sins must die. But I will forgive you. But still, death must occur as the payment for your sin. Someone will pay it and I can forgive you. You don't have to pay it. Welcome to Jesus Christ, our Lord, the Lamb of God. Yep, sort of truth. And he noticed it again. God provided the ram. He provided the sacrifice. You catch it? So what are you learning here? Luisa, Marcy, everyone else. You're learning when God says something, it must be done. He doesn't contradict himself. He doesn't nullify his word, doesn't abrogate it. And he cannot prove false to his word and his promise whether it's a promise of blessing or judgment. So then what happens? You said to Adam, the day he eats, he dies. He didn't die. Did you go back on your word? No. I extended his earthly life out of mercy, but then I had something else die in his place to take his punishment so that I can keep my word of judgment, proving faithful and just, but also showing him love and mercy. You see how it works? That's Jesus Christ. That's the story of the gospel. That's the cross. Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Who's not getting this? Because it's like awfully silent. It's awfully silent. Don't ask me whether it's eternal. Don't go into a side tangent, Raph, because I'm going to block you because I don't like the way you're, uh, where this question is leading. It depends on what you mean, eternal. But don't ask me that. Focus. Everyone got it? So just like with Abraham, just like with Abraham, he didn't simply let Abraham and Isaac go. No, there has to be a burnt offering. But instead of your son, I'm going to give you a substitute to sacrifice in the place of your son as a burnt offering. Adam, you must die. But in my love for you, I won't let you die on that day that you eat, even though I said you will die because I'm going to have an animal die in your place and then from the skin of that animal, clothe you and cover up your nakedness. And this is from the first three chapters of Genesis. And as Billy, was it Bill Shepard or Billy Mandalay? I think it was Shepard yesterday said, this is why, this is why, you have a concerted effort by Satan using the scientific establishment and even theologians to get you to lose trust and confidence 
and the historical accuracy of Genesis. Because Satan knows if he destroys your belief in Genesis, he's destroyed the foundation of your faith. Yep, it was. Jehovah Jireh. Genesis 22, 14. Are you with me there? Do you see why there's such an effort from the scientific community and even the scholastic community, academia, and even theologians to get you to doubt the historicity of Genesis? Because if I destroy your faith in Genesis, I destroyed the foundation of the gospel. Right? Now let's look at Genesis 3.21 one more time. Phyllis, don't ask me unre unrelated questions. I'm going to say it again. I already have sessions on Abraham and Isaac as a picture of Christ on my YouTube channel and in articles. Focus. The focus is not Abraham and his son. That's incidental. Focus or you're going to get lost and you're not going to benefit. I want you guys to learn and benefit. That's why I'm being tough. Genesis 3.21, unto Adam and to his wife, the Jehovah God make coats of skin and clothe them, right? Clothe them, right? You with me there? Romans 13, verse 14. Romans 13, verse 14. Let's read 11 to 14 for the context. Romans 13, verse 14, 11 to 14. Watch here. Romans 13, verse 11 to 14. And that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of God. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. Now notice verse 14. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Clothe yourself with Jesus Christ like God clothed them with the coats of skin. And make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Put on Jesus. Wear Jesus. Clothe yourself with Jesus. But notice the connection. When you clothe yourself with Jesus, you die to sin. No more sinful passion. No more sinful deeds. Everyone getting it? Everyone, but I want it to sink in. You see that, right? We are clothed with. We've put on Jesus Christ. We wear Jesus Christ. He clothes us. I don't want to move on until it sinks in. Right? Okay, good. So you see how much meat there is in Genesis. So we saw the effects of Genesis, the fall, the sin of Adam and Eve. Right? We saw the effects of sin upon Adam and Eve. Right? It had a psychological effect, an emotional effect. Right? A spiritual effect, a physical effect. Because what's the effect that has on, on our bodies? Our bodies now decay, grow old, and return to dust. Now let's go to Genesis 3, 17, 19. Other effects of sin. Genesis 3, 17, 19. So I'm going to probably just focus on chapter 3 again to bring out as much meat as possible by the grace of God. And then we're going to do another session. You know i got to do at least another session on this. Genesis 3, 17 to 19. Okay? And unto Adam, pay attention, he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree, which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. I'm going to make your labor hard, painful, and strenuous, so that the ground will not reap all that it could possibly reap because of your sin. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. You didn't want it easy. You didn't want a paradise. You didn't want everything at your feet given to you out of my love and my mercy. You want things the hard way. All right. Here you go. Till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken, 
For thus thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Here's another important feature. Another important feature of sin. The sin of Satan and the sin of humans. People think that sin, Satan's sin and human sin only affected humanity. No. Remember, God entrusted the physical creation to Adam and Eve. So God said, part of your punishment is, even the world that you rule will now be affected, tainted, and corrupted by your sin. So plant life has been tainted. Trees have been tainted. The seas have been tainted. The, the waters have been tainted. The clouds have been tainted. The stars and the moon and the sun have been tainted. Insects have been tainted, right? Birds have been tainted. All physical creation has been tainted, corrupted by sin. And you know what's the proof? If we were living in a perfect world in which there was no sin, you wouldn't have bats carrying the coronavirus onto human beings and spreading like wildfire. Why do bats have viruses? Why do dogs get cancer? Why do animals get sick? Because of sin. Because of sin. Is it making sense now? Sin has corrupted, tainted all creation. The universe, everything in it, as well as the spiritual realm because of Satan. Think about it, folks. If we were living before the fall, do you think there would be bats with the coronavirus? And do you think humans would be eating bats? Because up until the flood, no one was eating animals. They only ate fruits and vegetables. Genesis 9 says humans were only given authority to eat flesh of animals after the flood, after they came out of the ark. I like this, what Cloudy said. Let me repeat what he just said. We have no idea how sinful sin is, 100%. You understand what you just read from the Bible? Animals have been tainted. Insects have been tainted. Birds have been tainted. Sea life has been tainted. The winds, the waves have been tainted. The earth crust has been tainted. The moon, the sun, and the stars, they all have been tainted because of sin. It's all tainted. It's all corrupt. It's all wearing out until Jesus comes and transforms the entire universe and removes the effect of sin. Now, quote for me either, yeah, quote for me the NIV here. Not because I, uh, the NIV is as good as the King James, but... To make it clear, do me a favor, Protestant, either ESV or NIV, Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 25. If you don't believe me, here you go. Paul says it, Romans 8, verse 18 to 25. So why are snakes biting humans and dying? Why are there insects that prey on other insects and torture one another? Why do insects carry diseases and infect us? All because of sin. Romans 8, 18 to 25. Read. It's so what the Bible says, Romans 8, verses 18 to 25. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will, re will be revealed in us. Okay? For the creation, creation, folks, not just humans, waits in eager expectation for the children of God. So you have creation and the children of God, we believers, to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope, meaning God subjected. God, why did you subject, subject creation, the elements, to corruption? Because of the judgment of sin, because of the sin of Adam and Eve and of Satan. But there's hope for us and creation that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. Okay? We know that the whole creation, some of it, the whole creation, all of it has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth. Because when a woman goes in labor pains, she's about to give birth to life. So these, these earthquakes, tsunamis, 
tornadoes, volcanic eruptions. These are all birth pains awaiting Jesus to come and give birth to a new heaven, new earth. Okay? Not only so, we, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Meaning once Jesus comes, we don't need to hope for his coming. It's realized. It's no longer hope. It's a reality. But until he comes, my hope is he will come. When he comes, that hope is realized. I don't need to hope anymore. It's a reality. I see it and I'm experiencing it. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we have hope for what we do not have, we wait for it patiently. Who's amazed by this? That the Bible explains to you why the entire universe is messed up. Why you have insects torturing insects. Why do you have <clears throat> plants that are poisonous and deadly? Why you have <clears throat> earthquakes and volcanic eruptions and tornadoes and tsunamis? Why do you have all of this? Because of sin. I've told people, and I'm going to say it again. The Bible has the answer for everything, but you may not like the answer. The Bible has the answer for everything, but you may not like the answer. And here is the sad reality, folks. Because of Adam and Eve and their sin, even infants and children who haven't sinned against God suffer the corruption of what Adam and Eve did and what Satan did. So you have children born with deformities, children born with cancer. All because of that. I know a lot of people don't like to hear that. But that's why. That's reality. Not because these infants are sinful or God hates them. He loves them and adores them. But this is part of the universe that God created. In other words, what God is teaching you from here. Yeah, that's another punishment. Women now will give birth in labor pains to such an extent that those pains can even cause them their lives. Genesis 3.16. But now... Yep, it did. Yeah, everything was messed up on the molecular level, on the cellular level. Every part and fabric of your being and creation was tainted by sin. That's the teaching of the Bible. You may not believe it. You may reject it and say fairy tale, baloney. That's okay. That's between you and God. I'm just simply telling you what the Bible teaches. Another thing you're supposed to learn from this is human responsibility and a concept called let me let me explain this concept this is a concept theologians came up with the term but you don't need to know the term right but the term is corporate solidarity you know what corporate solidarity means let me explain this this is a biblical concept the term is not in the bible but the concept is taught corporate solidarity means we are all part of one corporation one body it's called the human corporation Every member of that body, corporation, is affected by the choice of either the head of that company or other members related to that company. Okay? It's called corporate solidarity. Let me give you modern examples. Let me give you modern examples. Okay. A family falls under corporate solidarity. A nation falls under corporate solidarity. A church falls under corporate solidarity. Right? Right? Your job falls under corporate solidarity. Now, I'm going to give you real-life examples that prove how accurate and true the Bible is. All reality proves the Bible is true. Even atheism and their hatred and rage prove the Bible is true. Okay, let me tell you corporate solidarity. An owner of a company, and I've used these examples in the past, AD can testify. An owner of the company decides, you know what? It's not very lucrative for me. To have my business here in America because the taxes are killing me. But if I open up the same business, let's say in Mexico, I can make a killing. But in his corporation, he's got about 500 employees. He shuts down. He opens up that same corporation in Mexico. And he hires 500 people. Now notice what happens. Because of that one man's decision, 500 people are left unemployed. And those 500 people... Not only did it affect them, but all their family members who depended on them and that paycheck. 
Do you see how that one action brought disastrous consequences for everyone that was under the head of that corporation? Are you with me there? Did it sink in? Yes, animals are under the authority of human beings. Remember that, Ariel? And, and Adam was given authority over humans. So his choices affect them, whether he likes it or not, whether they like it or not. But now the people in Mexico, that man opened his business in Mexico. 500 people got hired. So not only was it a blessing for them, now it blessed their family members who now benefit from the head of the household making a paycheck and being able to provide for their needs. So corporate solid solidarity has both good and bad effects. Now, how does this tie in with the Bible? Adam, the head of the human corporation, what he did damns us. The last Adam, the head of a new human corporation, what he did blesses us and grants us everlasting life. See how that works? So this is what the Bible teaches. This is also taught in Romans 5, verses 15 to 21. What I just told you is the Bible. Again, quote either ESV or NIV, Romans 5, verses 15 to 21. So I can show you, I just gave you Bible. I didn't make it up. Here, notice. Two human corporations, Cloudy. Corporation headed by the first man who corrupted the company and another corporation restored by the second man. Okay, here. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, Adam, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by his favor, his unmerited favor, his grace, of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many. Watch. Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. No, nor can, pay attention now. Okay, I want you to read this, right? Okay. Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. I'll explain that in a minute. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man. Death came upon all of us, even children who've done nothing. How much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation of all people, so also one righteousness, one righteous act, right? <clears throat> righteous act. I lost my place. Yep, we lost it. That's what happens when you guys keep texting. And I'm going to blame you for it. <sighs> so also one righteous act resulted in justification of life for all people. One righteous act resulted in justification of life for all people. For, it, for just as through the disobedience of the one man, one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. 20 to 21. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, sin conquers you because you die because of sin. So it rules over you by, by making you die. So also grace, God's favor, will reign over you through the righteousness of Jesus Christ to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There you go. You see it? That's corporate solidarity. You have two heads of a corporation, Adam and Jesus. Adam, because of what he did, destroyed the company, corrupted the company, tainted the company. So all the members of that company are now suffering because of him. Right, One mistake, and he destroyed the company shut down. He infected every member of his company with the sin virus. He got it, and he passed it on. The cure is in Jesus, who's the head of another company, a company of human beings being restored because of his love, because of his mercy, because of his obedience, because of his life, because of his death. He's the antidote to the virus for all those who are united to him. 
And that corporation by Jesus is called the Church of Jesus Christ, the body of Jesus Christ, the spiritual body made up of us human members, born of the Spirit, united to him. Did you catch it here? One sin of Adam brought death, the virus. And Jesus came after many sins had been com committed. Millions and millions of sins, rebellious, defiant acts were committed against God until Jesus showed up. And he undone all those sins by his life of obedience, his death and resurrection for the person who believes and trusts in him. Everyone getting it or no? Is it making sense? Now let me give you a final. God bless you too, Damut. A final damning, damaging effect of sin that's going to blow many of the women here away. Many of you already know this because you've heard me talk about this in the past. AD knows this. But remember, we're creatures of repetition. The more we hear something, the better we are at then understanding and absorbing it, making, making it second nature by the power of the Holy Spirit so we can share it with others. Okay, now are you ready? for a f There's a lot, but I'm going to give you a final one for now. Final damning, damaging effect of sin. You sure you're ready? This one directly ties in with male and female relationships. Male and female relationships. Why marriages fail. Why relations between men and women end up sometimes in very disastrous consequences. You ready? Are you ready? It's now about male and female relationships. So if you're single, pay attention. If you're divorced, unfortunately, like me, Lord, have mercy on us and our ex-spouses. Bring us to the feet of Jesus. Pay attention. Genesis 3, 16. What does God say to Eve? Genesis 3, 16. Watch here. Genesis 3, 16. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. Right? Greatly. You're going to be so, experience so much physical pain that it may even cause to your life. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. But now here is the last part where I want you to pay attention. In fact, believe it or not, uh, birth is a leading cause of death in many countries that don't have the medical benefit that we have in the West. That's how dangerous giving birth is, right? But anyway, here's the, last, the part I want you to focus in. As Holy Spirit guides me with wisdom from his glorious presence, to interpret scriptures for the glory of Jesus. Notice the last part. And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Thy desire shall be for thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, I didn't make up this interpretation, and there are people who disagree, but this is a common interpretation. That part, thy desire, your desire, shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. That word, desire and rule, those two words, same two Hebrew words, desire and rule, Used in Genesis 4 verse 7, when Cain got angry with Abel because God accepted Abel's sacrifice and not Cain and had hate in his heart, notice what God says to Cain in Genesis 4 verse 7. In Genesis 4 verse 7. If thou doest well, it's not to Cain. If you do well, will, not, will you not be accepted? Cain, what's wrong with you? If you do well in my sight, won't I accept you? Now watch. And if thou doest not well, if you don't do well in your heart, this hatred in your heart, you don't check it, sin lieth at the door. And by the way, here sin is referring to a spirit creature, a demon, not sinful inclination, as some people erroneously think. The word is referring to a demonic entity that God is calling sin. Sin lieth at the door, the door of your heart. Unto thee shall be his desire... Thou shalt rule over him. Wow, wait. Same two words. Sin will desire you. You will rule over it. Woman, you'll desire 
your husband, he'll rule over you. Now, remember, Genesis 3 is punishment for their sin, not blessing. Pay attention. Genesis 3, it's God's punishment and discipline for his disobedient children. He's not blessing them. He's saying, this is your punishment. This is your discipline. What's your punishment, woman? You'll desire the man. He'll rule over you. Just like sin desires to have you, Cain, but you must rule over it. That's not good. It's punishment and judgment. Remember when Eve desired the tree, was that something good or is that sinful? When sin desires to ensnare Cain, is that something good or is that something evil, sinful? Okay. So what does it mean when God says to Cain, you're going to rule over sin? You will not let sin control you. You will not let sin ensnare you. You will not let sin take you captive. You will conquer it. You will control it. You will subjugate it. Bring it under your control. And that's what God is saying is going to happen between male and female relationships. The woman will desire to ensnare the man, and the man will try to subjugate her and bring her under his feet. In other words, it's not good. That's why, folks, remember I said the Bible, the reality, experience proves the Bible right? Our experience proves the Bible right? Have you ever wondered why? Pay attention, especially those of you in the world. Why is it that when a man ignores the woman and treats her like garbage, she can't stay away from him? And she wants him even more. But the moment a man is nice, she walks away, <clears throat> turns her back on him, and is turned off by him because of that sinful desire to ensnare him. As long as she cannot ensnare him, she's going to want him more. And as long as the man treats her like dirt, subjugates her, she's going to want him more. You can thank Adam and Eve for the reality of male and female relationships being what they are. And you know what I'm talking about. You guys know what I'm talking about. Those of you who were in the world, thank Jesus you're not in the world. Thank Jesus you're not in the world. You're in Christ. You don't play those games. But be honest with me. Women, is it not true that the men that turned you on were the guys who were hard to get and ignored you and didn't give you the time of day, but the nice guys you just ignored? And men, is it not true that the more you treated women like dirt and ignored them, the more they want you? Prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. And the Bible told you why. See, the Bible told you why. Why is it that I'm nice to this girl and she could care less about me and ignores me and she just wants to be my friend. She puts me in a friend zone because she's a fallen sinner who's not regenerated, not born of the spirit, not walking in the spirit, but in her flesh. Why is it that this guy, no matter how much I love him or I do whatever, even jump in bed with him, he just doesn't give me the time of day and he treats me like dirt and I can't tame him because he's a sinner, unregenerate, dead in sin, not walking in the spirit, but walking in the flesh. And as long as one of the partners are walking in the flesh, that relationship will end. It is inevitable that it will end. You want me there? Are you blown away that this problem with male and female relationships was there in Genesis 3.16? And God announced this is now the judgment and the discipline upon you? Who would have thought this was part of the fall, part of the sin, and part of the punishment and discipline for the sin of Adam and Eve? So what's the story of the cross? The story of the cross is men and women set free from that sinful control Sinful passion, sinful desire, sinful enslavement, given the power and the life of the Holy Spirit to now do things God's way, given the power now to honor the other and not try to ensnare the other or subjugate the other. Those things are done away with in Christ. They've been erased by the blood of Christ. If you're truly born of the Spirit and you truly are walking in Christ. Clear? Clear? 
Folks, let me be honest with you. If you're a believer right now and you're married, the moment one of you stops walking with Jesus, stops worshiping Jesus, stops loving Jesus, stops praying to Jesus, stops singing to Jesus, stops meditating upon the Bible, and engages more in worldly activity, worldly relationships, worldly music, it will be inevitable you're going to feed your own sinful desires and your needs ahead of Jesus' will. And if inevitably you're going to be turned off by your partner and look for companionship somewhere else, destroying the marriage, ending in divorce. And it's inevitable, and I promise you that's what will happen. It happened to me. Shamefully, it happened to me. And my two angels, who I have not heard from for two weeks, whom I love and ache for, but I love Jesus more than them, they're suffering. My two angels. Okay? And Sahih Christian, pray for him too. Him too. He's suffering. God is blessing with six wonderful children. Actually eight. Pray God will bless all eight of them and preserve them for the glory of Jesus. Okay? Let me repeat for you who are married, a warning. Let me repeat again. Listen, you cannot falsify the Bible. The world proves the Bible is 100,000% absolutely true because it's the word of the creator who knows the human plight better than humans do. And our daily activities prove and validate the truth of the Bible. Let me repeat this again. Okay. Let me repeat this again. Okay, listen. The moment when one spouse stops pursuing Jesus, praising Jesus, singing to Jesus, loving Jesus, speaking to Jesus, reading the word or hearing the word to hear from Jesus, and starts feeding his own desires, his own cravings, worldly music. I'm not saying, by the way, I'm not saying worldly music is sinful. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying, so don't misunderstand me. What I'm saying is now, all your time is occupied in worldly activities, sports, movies, the gym, worldly music, and less time with Jesus. The more you feed your flesh and you, the more you indulge in the world and its activities, the less you feed your spirit and the less you engage in spiritual training and exercise activities, your marriage is bound to end. Amen, Alex Matos. Marriage is between three. Jesus Christ, the husband, and the wife. Is that clear? I hope this session blessed you. You know I got to do a part three. I'm going to do a part three. Not today, God willing. Now, folks, because most of you, even though officially you haven't been quarantined, you're pretty much quarantined. You're inside. You're not working. You're just waiting for the Lord Jesus Christ to either come in glory or to take us out of this, either by reviving the economy again out of his grace and mercy, which we don't deserve, or maybe even get the coronavirus and go to go home to be with Jesus and rest. Whatever it is, you're stuck home. If you really want me to, because we had a good crowd today. This past week, we've been getting over 100, and it's blessing my heart because I want more people to come. In spite of my anger issues, like Sai Christian told me yesterday in the text message, that's why David Wood gets 100, and you barely get 100. Thank you, Sai Christian. That was really encouraging, really uplifting. With friends like these, who needs Muslims? But anyway, we have a love-hate relationship. He hates to love me, and I love to hate him. But anyway, because you're locked in, it's now my time, 6 p.m. my time. 6 p.m. my time, which means it's 9 p.m. New York time. God willing, I can do an open Q&A, open Skype, 7.30 p.m. my time. 7.30 p.m. my time which means 10.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, no later than 8 p.m., 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. How many of you want to come? How many of you will come? Because I want to see 130 even more. You guys okay? You sure? But if you say yes, bring your questions because it's not a session. It's an open Q&A Q &A on any subject if the Spirit leads me to answer your question. So bring your questions, please. You can call me on Skype or text them. Otherwise, you're going to be sitting there and I'll be singing. We'll be saying it all on a highway. All right. So, Lord willing, uh, an hour and a half to two hours, I'll be back in Jesus' name.
because I want to make the most of my time because, folks, no greater joy than worshiping Jesus, loving Jesus, praising Jesus, being in the presence of Jesus, trusting Jesus, and then worshiping him together as a body, teaching his word, hearing his word, proclaiming his word. And I got nothing but time here. I'm all here by myself. Don't have my girls. Pray for my angels. I haven't heard from them in nearly two weeks. Pray Jesus flood them in his love. And I'm not worried because I know they are in his hands. I miss them, but they are in his, the hands of my God who loves them. Christ is risen, risen indeed. See you guys an hour and a half to two hours. Invite people. I want to see 150. Come on now. Let's falsify Sai Christians. Curse on me. Love you guys. Christ is risen.